David, we were talking about this, uh, this patient that I presented, and we talked a bit about etiology, that is what caused disease, and we talked some about natural history, that is where the disease might, uh, might lead. I wonder if, if you could comment on some of the strategies we might be able to use to re reduce the risk of that progression or perhaps reduce the risk of de disease developing in the first place. Well, this is an important concept that we're wrestling with as we move from the 20th century into the 21st century. Uh, traditionally, we've been trying to make a diagnosis, and once you have a diagnosis, you give a standard treatment, and you assume the patient's going to get better. What we're seeing with chronic pancreatitis and other chronic inflammatory disorders is that it's a process that uh, begins for a variety of reasons and then progresses and can result in a variety of complications. And so it is a process that we're studying rather than just an event and a diagnosis. We spend a little bit of time talking about the risk factors, and I view those as the drivers uh, of the process. It tells you what part of the gland is most likely going to be susceptible to injury, and once it occurs, then you end up having an inflammatory response, and uh, it begins to uh, take on the the effects of the immune system as the immune system causes uh, scarring and damage and changes the uh, pancreas itself. And we know that as the injury and inflammatory process continues, eventually a variety of complications occur, including uh, things like uh, loss of exocrine function, endocrine function, pain, and cancer risk. So the things I think we want to start focusing on is that as soon as you make a diagnosis, you want to begin looking at ways of reducing the risk of recurrent injury and the risk of progression. So you've talked a little bit about uh, the uh, early diagnosis. Uh, what we've done from a conceptual standpoint is envisioned a process that changes the risk factors into etiologies. Many of us have mutations for all kinds of bad things, and we don't even want to know about it. Uh, but nothing happens. And that's the way it is with patients with risk for pancreatic disease. They may have a variety of genetic disorders, and they're perfectly fine until something happens and changes their pancreas from being fine to having this, uh, beginning this process. We have envisioned this as an episode of acute pancreatitis, and the reason is that that activates the immune system, and it's the immune system that seems to be driving a lot of the pathology. So once a patient has an episode of acute pancreatitis, now the physicians want to begin uh, carefully observing whether or not a process that is going to lead to pancreatic destruction uh, has begun. So you've described this patient, this woman, and what was the event that started the process in her? Well, it was an episode of acute pancreatitis. I guess I don't know for sure what, what, what it is that led to that event. We, I recognize the event, or the event is recognizable. I know that in many patients, the event, I can't point to a particular point in time and say it started on that day. In this patient, I think we could. We could say something happened that led to this acute event, and that was the origin of her disease. But in many of the patients I see, I can't identify that initial uh, event. I know it had to have occurred because I see the consequences of it, but timing it is, is very, very challenging. Right. So, the, so acute pancreatitis is really a warning to pay attention to the pancreas, not just for that moment, but to watch the patient to see if things are happening. And certainly recurrent episodes uh, really are a, a very important warning signal. Uh, one of the areas that we are, have been talking about is risk reduction. And this woman you've mentioned uh, is a smoker. And so stopping smoking turns out to be a very important intervention. There was a, a study that was not uh, uh, quoted very often from Italy in the, uh, around 2007 that showed that if you stop smoking, you could slow the progression of uh, pancreatic uh, fibrosis and uh, I think that we're now recognizing that was probably very insightful. But um, there's a couple problems we have 
why this hasn't been uh, looked at a little bit more closely. Uh, the first one is that uh, physicians often never ask the patient about smoking. They'll drill them on drinking, but they'll miss the more important factor, which is smoking. And the one thing that I know that many of us don't have any skills at, and I include myself in this, is in how to encourage or support a patient in smoking cessation. I'm learning how to do that after this data came out, but prior to that, I probably didn't ask the question enough, and I certainly didn't intervene as much as I should have. Even in our NAPS2 study of 20 centers, we found that um, a large proportion of the physicians never ask about smoking because we were never taught that that was an important factor. And uh, what we've also learned is that it's much more difficult to get a patient to stop smoking than it is to get them to stop drinking. It's interesting when this young woman that I presented, it's, um, it's interesting to think what might have occurred if she never started smoking. Would that have uh, led to a, a situation where that event never uh, reached a point where it, where it you know, crossed the threshold and started? Or, uh, and then if we can convince her to stop smoking, what does the future hold for her? Is it gonna be substantially better, slightly better, dramatically better? I don't think I know the answer to that question in terms of the effectiveness of these risk reduction strategies. Do you have any insight in terms of what we might expect? We have, I guess, the best data on smoking, right? We can reduce the risk of subsequent cancer. We can reduce the rate of progression. We might be able to reduce the rate of getting pancreatitis in the first place or having recurrent attacks after the initial attack. And there's also an interesting uh, problem with uh, smoking and pain and pancreatitis. It's different between men and women as well. So there's a lot more that we need to, to learn about. This woman was not a drinker, but uh, there's an important paper from um, Finland that showed that in people who are drinking and have recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis, uh, drinking sensation changes the course of that disease as well. So those are important factors. Uh, we have been looking at the 1,000 patients that I mentioned from the NAPS2 study, and interestingly, the patients that have more than one episode of acute pancreatitis often progress to chronic pancreatitis over six to eight years. The exception are those that are drinking. It uh, progresses in, in two to three years. So drinking and uh, smoking, and we're not able to tease out the combination because they usually go together, uh, rapidly accelerates the process toward uh, from acute pancreatitis to chronic pancreatitis. We've also found there's a genetic factor, SPINK1 mutations, that have the same effect, and that's not so easy to change because uh, it's too late to change your parents. This is important, though, because a patient that we see is on a rapid course to pancreatic destruction, they have a terrible pain syndrome, uh, the option of having your pancreas removed with a total pancreatectomy and salvage their islet cells and place them in the liver and prevent both the pain syndrome and the develop, eventual development of diabetes uh, is an option for the most severe cases. But what's even better is to be able to understand how to stop the progression and uh, provide a healthy life for these individuals.